Do we need to try that again? <laughs> now I'm ready. <laughs> okay, so first thing right out of the chute is you are not your mind. And for a lot of the time, you don't even have one. You find that hard to believe? How do you act? How do other people act? Maybe that's the easier one. Okay, so, you know all that mental chatter that goes on inside our head? that we used to believe was the central me. Okay, we're not that. So all those experiences that are happening to that central you, hmm. What about the thoughts that you think? Oh, goodness me. Do you ever consider that they're just one more category of things that you experience? Like the fragrances in the air, the sights before your eyes, you're not your mind. Okay, I see the block starting to shift and move out of that most magnificent foundation you built upon which you have established yourself. <laughs> so watch the cracks and look for the light because here we go. Life. What about life? It unfolds in moments. That's our point of contact. The moments. I once called this the most important thing that I've learned. Was that life unfolds only in moments. If you look at it this way, then you can say, well, wait a minute. Instead of trying to solve everything in my life, past, present, and future, I do a, a little checking here. And I come to realize life only happens in moments. I can handle a moment. I can put everything at my power, my disposal, into working this moment. And if I have to work it over, there'll be another one that'll show up right after that. So it's a moment by moment experience. So, also, the quality of your life. The quality of your life is determined by how you deal with these moments. Not by what moments show up or what moments don't show up. Or how they show up. The quality, okay, is how you deal with your moments. And is life real? Oh my goodness, no! Most of life is imaginary. <laughs> as shocking as that may sound, and as shocking as it may seem, most of what we interact with in the world itself is about our beliefs. It's about our expectations. And it's about our personal interests. It doesn't have a whole lot to do with what's really there. It has a lot to do with that imaginary fluff stuff that you used to think was you making reference to the mind. I've been through some terrible things in my life. Some of which actually happened. <laughs> And I wish I were smart enough to have come up with that first, but I'm not. But I am smart enough to use it again. And Mark Twain wouldn't mind at all. Think about all the imaginary things you experience 
that don't have a bit of real to them, except the real you pour into them. I also heard one time where it was said that humans have evolved to suffer. Hmm. That's a bit of a stretch for me. But I can definitely see how humans have evolved through suffering. And that most of us still walk hand in hand with suffering as if it were our best friend. That suffering is a part of the human experience? Yes, there's no doubt about that. When you stop and think about your relationship to suffering, if you find yourself suffering, don't you immediately go to the conclusion, oh, there's something wrong with me. I shouldn't be suffering. Well, what if that has nothing to do with who you really are? What if suffering is a result of some kind of action that goes on almost all the time where you're either trying to change or escape the present moment. So, if you look at it that way, then you can see the possibility that suffering doesn't necessarily mean that my life is going wrong. Then also puts it in my court I can do something about that. Because after all, this is my life. But then we come to look at it from, well, how are you feeling about that? How many of us rely so heavily upon our feelings, our emotions? When maybe the reason emotions exist is to make us biased. Well, how do your emotions affect you? Do they just open you up to everything? No, they don't. They bring you right into that narrow field of whatever it is that you're feeling. I used to believe that my emotions were reliable indicators as to the state of my life. Mm -hmm. <laughs> After a while, I stopped telling others about it. <laughs> it didn't change the fact that I experienced it, but the point is, is that your emotions cannot really be trusted for measuring your self-worth or your position in life. But they are great at teaching you what you cannot let go of. Oh, goodness me. Which would you prefer, this or fundamentalism? <laughs> I know, sometimes fundamentalism is so easy, isn't it? You just give yourself over to somebody else, and you let them take care of you. Well, if you're already among the elect and you're saved, hey, you can do any damn thing you want to. I mean, maybe at the end you'll have to have a few words with somebody, but you're already cool. You've made it. Hmm. So, did I just step into the realm of beliefs? I did. How many of you feel really proud of your beliefs? Aren't your beliefs something to be proud of? <laughs> Let's go to a convention, shall we? Let's go to the Republican convention. Okay? Won't we see a lot of proud Republicans there? Yes, or even a Democratic convention. Won't we see a lot of proud Democrats there? Yes, and won't they just tell us how proud they are of their beliefs? Yes, they will. Come to church, won't they tell you how proud they are of their beliefs? Son of God, personal savior, only one, Yes! <laughs> By the way, believing something is not an accomplishment. Ooh. <laughs> By the way, I got the okay from Dr. Foster, all right? <laughs> <laughs> 
Yeah, beliefs are easy. <laughs> now, the stronger your beliefs are, the less open you are to growth and wisdom. Because strength of belief is only the intensity with which you resist questioning yourself. Ooh. I see a lot of head shaking, and it's mostly in this direction. <laughs> as, as soon, as soon as you're proud of a belief, as soon as you think it adds something to who you are, you've just made it a part of your ego. Now, that's something to be proud about. <laughs> I think that's better than being proud of being a Democrat, don't you? <laughs> or even a Republican. Or even a born again. Or a dead again. <laughs> I know I'm just doing all kinds of toe-stepping here. <laughs> I have my feet behind the podium for safety's sake. <laughs> okay. Now, here's a fact about who we are. We have two primary motivations that we offer, operate by in life. One, we want to fulfill our desires. Everybody's got that one? Yes. We're all on that page? Yes. Everybody wants to fulfill their desires, yes? Yes. Yes? Yes. 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 yes? Okay. What are you holding back just because of, I haven't mentioned the number two yet? <laughs> okay. If you want to fulfill your desires, then you also want to escape your suffering. So those are the two primary motivators that are always there up front for each and every one of us. And it really does so much to explain behavior when you experience somebody acting in a way that you think is so unpleasant, so inconsiderate, so domineering, so, my God, where's that big toothbrush so I can clean myself out because of what I'm having to experience here? But the fact is, you see, in the moment, all of us do the very best that we can, but we are being affected by these two primary motivations. So you might want to carry that around as a little card so when you get into a situation, you can pull it out. And, all right, let's see. Okay, I got it. So you can be a little clearer of why you're doing what you're doing and how you're doing. And I know, don't all of us just love to consider ourselves as being objective? Let's be objective about this. I mean, after all, you're a pain. We know it. Let's be objective. About it. <laughs> but, you know, objectivity is subjective. You see, the fact is, subjectivity is the primary experience. Everything is subject to you. Everything is subject to me. What I derive from my subjective experience, I may compile and build up to give myself a sense of where I am in all of this, and then I claim I'm being objective. Everybody knows you deserve it. That I took the opportunity and had the gun was simply circumstantial. That you got in the way of the bullet in the wall was happenstance. And I can be very objective about that because all I did was pull the trigger. You got in the way of the bullet. Subjectively, I can feel very good about it because I really didn't like you anyhow. <laughs> and now I don't have to deal with you anymore because all of that will be taken care of. 
I might have a problem so far as my residence from here on out, but then again, <laughs> that might be taken care of for me too. <laughs> but these are some points to bring forward so far as looking at our primary motivations and then bringing them into a field of operating clarity to where we don't delude ourselves by believing that we are our mind. And we recognize that anything and everything that happens, happens only in the moment by the moment. That's the way life actually occurs. And that what I perceive of it, for the most part, is going to be imaginary. Because I don't really have a clue of what's going on with you, so far as knowing exactly why you're choosing to be the way that you are. We come to a place of realizing this whole thing, we're in the process of unraveling it. So that in its unraveling, more light will come through. And we'll find that then we're able to shift out of who we believed ourselves to be and begin to open up to greater discovery. Because you see, who you believe yourself to be right now isn't you. Who I believe myself to be right now, it isn't me. Before today's lecture, I went over a little review of who I have believed myself to be over the years that I have been living and compared it to who I perceive myself, perceive, believe myself to be now. There's some carryover recognizable, at least I recognize it. But at the same time, I am caused by experience to realize I have let go of many of the beliefs I've had about myself because I've come to see them as being either interfering with my life in a very direct way or because I had to give so much of my energy to support them, they weren't really worth the support and I ventured out into unknown territory with enough of me available to where if I get lost, I won't be alone. I might scare myself, but I at least won't be alone. So, you don't have to take any of this seriously. As a matter of fact, I think I'd even go so far as to suggest you don't. Sometimes reverse psychology works wonders. <laughs> <laughs> I know. You probably think you've got it already figured out. So you and yourself may be wondering, what am I doing here? Well, in your magnanimous nature, perhaps what you're doing is helping me to where it's better for everyone. And in that, I say thank you. Thank you. For more information about the Metaphysical Church of Enlightenment or the Rodin Foundation, please go to our website at www.rodin.org. If you have been inspired by the revelations shared in these podcasts, please donate to the Rodin Foundation's ongoing efforts to help others help themselves at www.rodin.org.